Well, in that case, I'm going to turn this over to uh, Phil Bork, and he's going to talk about the use of autonomous vessel technology in spill recovery. There you go, Phil. Oh. Yes, good morning. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, from wherever you are in the world. Um, I am on the East Coast here, so I'm going to go ahead and um, excited to be here today. So first off, thank you um, for having us, for inviting us. Um, what I'd like to do is first just offer a quick uh, couple slides on what Sea Machines does, who we are, um, and then I'm actually going to turn it over to a little bit more something, uh, a little bit more interactive, where we um, will share screens um, with uh, our team in Boston that will be doing a, a quick live demonstration um, of an autonomous boat, uh, two autonomous boats for you guys, and we'll talk about how that relates to spill response. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Give me a moment here. So you should, you should see my screen. Um, so a um, little bit on our company real quick. Um, I'm gonna try to keep this kind of quick and crisp um, so we can get to the fun stuff. But essentially we are a company started in 2015, um, developing autonomous control technology for existing work boats. Um, so basically our product uh, can be installed on uh, not, we don't make turnkey boats. Uh, we don't make autonomous boats in the sense of making the boat, we make the control system. Um, and that control system uh, gets installed onto what we could call vessels of opportunity. Um, we have two products that, that result from that effort. The Sea Machines 200, which is less of an autonomous system and more of a remote helm system. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that shortly. Um, and then the SM300, which is a, a packaged uh, control system that, that enables autonomy um, with behaviors for specific tasks. Um, you know, we, we as a company uh, have strived to make these two um, products uh, actually that, as opposed to a lot of the, the, the efforts in this space are project-based. Um, so that, that's a little bit about what we do. Um, we have about a, a team of about 35 uh, engineers, uh, scientists, um, people with marine backgrounds, um, and offices in Hamburg, Boston, as well as Denmark. Um, we are growing, um, and I got to say, we are a venture-backed company, so we're we're kind of a startup that's uh, growing up. Um, the uh, SM200 remote helm system. Um, is a, an industrial grade uh, remote control uh, setup that can be used to control a boat with line of sight. Um, this product has been used. Um, we have installed this system um, for spill response applications before, and there will be some more that we end up doing. Um, aside from spill response, what this product does is really largely uh, improves um, the solution for, for captains in the event of, of restricted visibility. Um, this particular tugboat is just a good example outside of the spill response domain where if you can see, if you're imagine if you're a captain, you're up on the top of this wheelhouse of this ATB tug and you're looking down, you know, you're 80 feet up in the sky and you're trying to look down when the bow is 20 foot long. So from the wheelhouse uh, length. So you, there's a geometry problem there and having the ability to walk outside the wheelhouse with those controls um, gives you a lot of flexibility. Outside of that, um, there's a lot, of, um, a lot of benefit for using this product in, in, in terms of um, working in crew boats, um, military applications, but spill response, it's all about removing the person from uh, the, the elements. Um, the autonomous control uh, piece takes that remote helm uh, system to the next level and offers the ability to do a little bit more pre-programmed and beyond line of sight or over the horizon uh, operation if someone wanted to. Um, so basically we, we add uh, from the remote manual control, now we're, we're basically completely um, 
controlling those tasks via an automated route. Um, and that for spill response could be doing grid work um, or collaborative um, work, which I'll show you shortly here and we'll show you live. Um, so that box that I just showed on this previous slide is, is about 20 by 20 by eight inches. And it integrates with all the, the vessel hardware, propulsion, steering, et cetera. And then there's a software side of it, which can be either on the boat or remotely uh, operated, which is what you'll see today. Um, so essentially this software, view it as your, your, your mission planner or your route planner, as well as your situational awareness tools. Um, as you can see here, there's, a, there's an ENC chart. Um, there's localization for where the boat is, as well as data from the boat, from engines, um, alarms, um, uh, head, of course, the, the, the basics are at your heading, position, your speed, um, but we can also um, activate a microphone, um, stream and understand what the weather is. So uh, on a regular basis, we actually um, use this, uh, we show this demonstration for, for customers around the world. And so it's pretty cool, it's a powerful tool to be able to tap into a, a boat, um, the insights of a vessel like this. Um, one of the things you know, people ask us, you know, how, what about an auto, what's different from your system and an autopilot? Um, well, what we do that's different than an autopilot um, is, is variable thrust. So typically with an autopilot, you, you basically you would plot your points, right? Or plot your chart plotter points, and you're going to be going along that the same speed. Um, we can actually, we, we control uh, that speed variably and that speed will be autonomously variable controlled in the event of uh, collision avoidance or um, some other um, behaviors like, for example, with grid, uh, grid mode, which we'll show you shortly. Um, specific to spill response, one big, you know, outside of, you know, automating the route and removing the person from the boat itself, a big um, uh, use case in the spill response domain is, is boom towing. And the ability to um, position one boat autonomously uh, relative to another vessel is something that we can do very easily. So we'll show we'll show this to you live. But essentially, what you have here is a screen that will um, we could basically drag this little icon here around in any orientation uh, and or dictate the distance uh, manually here, um, and then that this boat will basically stay in the same position relative to the mothership, uh, according to whatever speed um, the mothership was going. So uh, transversely here on this picture, um, this is a great use case, right? You could have two uh, autonomous tent boom tenders, um, and then those vessels could be, um, basically the distance between them could be actually autonomously managed as opposed to two crew that were jockeying for position um, or had to, you know, uh, to communicate con continuously to, to keep position relative to wind, current, et cetera, you'd have a system that just does that for you. Um, and so, so that's pretty powerful. Um, and uh, we're, we're fielding that um, today in, in a couple projects that, that aren't announced yet. A uh, little bit on obstacle points, and I'm gonna turn it over to our team here shortly. Um, the system I, I mentioned, we, we do have obstacle avoidance. Um, and that is via um, conventional sensors. So we can we ingest AIS, radar, uh, the chart data and depth data, and we can react to those. Um, so all those data streams get fused and then we react to those um, in order to make uh, uh, decisions to avoid obstacles for surface targets, uh, you know, whatever's on the charts, whatever's on, on, in the immediate area. Um, we, are, we have determined over the years that, you know, we're kind of limited with what the conventional sensors offer at times. I mean, I think even uh, us, us as, as uh, operators, right, know the limits of radar, et cetera. So what, what we've been working on is, is uh, developing computer vision, which uh, similar to like an autonomous car, right, where you're, 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 some of the cars are detecting the environment and then sensing that, uh, sending that sensed information into a processor. We're doing the same thing, but for the marine environment. Um, it's pretty exciting. Uh, we've been working on this for a couple of years with uh, a couple of shipping companies. And the plan there is once we build this database and it's uh, robust enough, it starts to get integrated into the collision avoidance system. 
Um, but that's, that's just kind of a, a quick brief on that stuff. You can, you can do different things in terms of changing the sensitivity of the system. And we may get to show you that um, really quickly, but we don't have a whole lot of time here. Um, so with that, I'd like to, to um, pass it to one of my colleagues in Boston. Uh, I'm currently in Virginia Beach uh, and my, my colleague is um, in Boston in, in her office, uh, which is Captain Lauren Lamb. And uh, we'll be uh, hosting you guys for a two boat demonstration today. Uh, thanks, uh, Lauren, for, for taking it from here. Yeah, no problem. Hi, everyone. So uh, my name is Lauren Lamb. I uh, run the test program at Sea Machines um, and I'm kind of the fleet manager for the two test vessels, soon to be three, that we have um, in Boston Harbor. So I'm going to share my screen and show you some of the stuff that Phil has mentioned um, but live. So here we go. Um, Phil, can you see that? Yep. Okay, great. So this is our user interface. I'm going to zoom all the way out for, I think Thomas was his name, who said he's homesick looking at Boston Harbor. So this is a chart of Boston Harbor here. Um, you can see where the boats are, where the radar is with all these uh, targets. And I'll zoom in a little bit to show you where Logan Airport is and where I am. It's a little bit laggy on Zoom sometimes, so I apologize. So right where my cursor is here is where I'm sitting. Um, we have the capability to do uh, operations over 4G and over satellite. So uh, right now we're operating over 4G. It also can be an on-vessel um, system as well, as, as Phil mentioned. So I'm gonna zoom back into our boat. So as Phil mentioned, this is a two boat demo. The boat that we're gonna be controlling right now is this light gray boat. Um, and this is gonna be the daughter ship in the collaborative following situation. So you can see the cameras down here. I'll expand this one and show you what our second test vessel, the lightning looks like. Um, and we look like we are on steadfast right now. So, so we have um, the right hand side here with all of the vessel information. Oh, Rick, Captain Rick is helping us out here with a good view of the lightning. So these are our two test vessels. You can see we have a satellite system on this boat and we're operating 4G on the steadfast. So I'm going to first do collaborative following. Um, I'm going to go to new. Load right here is where you would load a previously planned waypoint mission. I'm gonna select collaborative following. It's not a, a name, it's a behavior. So you don't need to put a name in here. It's gonna be completely dependent on where the mothership is. So. Again, as Phil mentioned, anywhere that I drag this daughter ship is where he's going to stay in relation to the mothership. So on the right hand, on the left hand side, I'm sorry, you can see that we have X and Y. You can enter those in, um, or you could just drag, which is what I just did. Um, you have error alarms um, for how far off the X and Y axis you are, and you can change these based off of how um, early you wanna be alarmed of that. And then you have two behaviors, depth avoidance, which will slow the boat down in low depth situations and seat keeping, which will slow the boat down um, relative to the roll pitch and heave. If you're getting excessive roll pitch and heave, it's gonna slow the boat down. I'm gonna uncheck those um, just for now, because obviously if you have any situation where you're slowing the boat down, you're not gonna be uh, following as closely. So I think um, the following behavior is more important for right now. So. I'm going to hit enable right here and it's going to bring up a collision avoidance menu for collaborative following collision avoidance is defaulted to off um, or you could pick those three parameters that Phil showed you a picture of I'm going to keep it defaulted to off for now and hit OK as soon as I hit OK the vessel is going to start following the mothership so you can see we got a mission deployed alert. You can see the mode in the top right corner is in follow now. Um, it was at none before, which meant that um, Bill, Captain Bill on the steadfast was just drifting. Um, his engines were in neutral, ready for the autonomy system to take over. So you can see we are going to get in line and follow the, the mothership. So anywhere he goes, we're gonna go. 
In the bottom right here, you can see the position error. The, that's that three and five meters that we had selected. You can see while we're getting into position, um, it's a little bit higher than that. So that's why they're flashing red because it's gonna, if it exceeds anything over three or five meters, it's going to um, let the user know. So I'll back up a little bit, I'll zoom out and show what the boat's doing. So you can see this, um, this camera inside the cabin here is strictly showing that the user's not doing anything. So um, Bill's actually in the call now. So he's, he's watching us and um, he's obviously not touching the controls at all. And then we have bow stern cameras and then our perception system here. So um, this is the alpha version of our perception system. Again, it's a little bit laggy, but you can see that we're detecting the, the lightning right here and it gives us a range and a bearing. Um, this is going to be fused with the ARPA and the AIS as Phil mentioned. Um, for now on the, on the user interface, the screen, we have displayed just the perception targets because the ARPA and the AIS are already on um, the user interface right here. So the fusion hasn't happened yet, um, but that's coming very soon. This um, timer is stressful. <laughs> Okay, so um, things I can, oh, sorry. So you can see that if, um, if I hit edit right here, it brings me back into this menu. And the cool thing about collaborative following is that you can change it dynamically. So while the mission's running, you don't need to abort and change positions. You can just update the position right here. It's gonna ask you every time if you need to do um, collaborative or collision avoidance. And if not, you can see that we kind of started moving a little bit faster, turning a little bit to get into that new position. So if you needed to adjust it a little bit on the fly, you can do so. Um, because we have three and a half minutes left, once we get into position, I'm gonna abort this and I will show you um, a grid, a survey, the survey mode that we have. We are running a little uh, early, so don't stress out on the time. Okay. Okay. I'll give you a couple extra minutes. Then. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it's good to know. Okay. So you can see we're right where that position I currently set is. And following is kind of a, a term that we use, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be behind the mothership. So we can actually also follow ahead. Um, we can follow in any position relative to the mothership that we like. So I'll change it one more time and go directly a beam and then we'll move on. You can see that Bill has vacated hiding in the background. So we have an unmanned situation. Okay, so I'm gonna abort this right here. It's gonna ask you if you're sure and then we are now, the mode you can see is back in none. So load again, will give you the option to have a previously planned mission run again. Um, we're, not, we're gonna plan one right now. So I'm gonna go into new, instead of hitting collaborative following, I'm gonna go into waypoint and hit create. And then we have all these, um, these options here. So I'm gonna really quickly go through them. So we have default leg speed and turn speed. Those are pretty self-explanatory. It's the speed at which the whole mission is gonna do unless you change it per waypoint, which I can show you how to do. Um, Cross-track error is for survey missions only. So this is vessels going under eight knots, maybe towing something. Um, this creates a really, really accurate um, track following behavior. And it can get Obviously it's trying to stay really close on track. So if you are going over eight knots, it can get a little bit fish daily. Um, so we have this turned off, which we can keep it off. That's fine. Cause we're not collecting any data, but for obvious reasons, survey missions would, would want that on um, and to get to stay on the, the line as much as possible. Mission auto repeat is again, exactly how it sounds. Um, after the last waypoint, instead of stopping and going back into neutral, it would go right back to the first waypoint and continue that mission forever until you manually abort. Um, leg line is how accurate you stay, how much you stay on track if there was a situation where you're deviating. So mainly collision avoidance, if you were to deviate from course, um, 
its decision is if it's checked, it's going to go back onto the track as soon as safely possible. If it's not checked, it's just going to go next right to the next waypoint. So it's not going to try to get back on track. It's just going to kind of create its own new track to the next waypoint. Um, then we have the two depth avoidance behaviors. So we have slow down and reverse. The slow down is the one that we have in collaborative following. It's going to slow the boat down proportional to the depth of water. And we have a new one um, that was just re released last week, excuse me. Um, and that is, um, it's going to reverse out of low depth situations. So this is another um, behavior that we have for survey companies who wanted to survey really low depth areas. And when you reach that threshold, back out and continue on the mission. So we have that um, implemented as well in this in this release. Then we have a depth safety area, which I'll show you in more depth, which is um, creating a bounding area around the safe water via the chart contours. So instead of using the, the depth sounder, like in the previous depth avoidance behavior, we used the, the charted depths, um, which are in mean lower low water. So it's the worst case scenario in that area, which is why we use both of them because there are some areas that you would be able to use um, or to operate in, in high tide, for example. And then we have sea keeping, which is the same as what I explained in um, collaborative following. So I'm gonna uncheck sea keeping again because we have the threshold set really high so we can test it. So it would immediately alarm um, and I'll hit okay. Collision avoidance again, uh, we're gonna disable this, but you again have the option to check um, any of the, the 500, 1000 or 2000 meter ranges. And then we're in waypoint mode. So now anywhere, sorry, anywhere that I double click is going to be a waypoint. And that's because we're in point mode here. Grid mode is what I'm going to show you right now. So this is where you set a survey grid. So I'm going to put in a small ish one that I just timed out a little bit before this demo to be about three minutes. Um, and this is the height of each leg, the width of the entire survey, the leg spacing between each um, between each leg. Actually, I think this was 150, so we have, we have four legs. And you can also do a GERD rotation. So right now it would be north to south. We could do, we could do whatever we want. Let's do 45. And we're going to add GERD. So now anywhere that I double click will be the top left corner of that GERD. And you can see there's nothing different about these waypoints than the, the one I've dropped first, it's just a less manual way of drawing something pretty accurate. So I'm gonna hit save here. This warning is gonna tell me that there's no danger checking between where we currently are and the first waypoint, which since we're very close to it, doesn't really matter. And then I'm gonna hit deploy. So when I hit deploy, you're gonna get, oh, see, <laughs> we have the depth threshold set really high too. So I'm gonna turn that off. Um, because we are going to be crawling if we do not, which I you can also do dynamically is change any of those um, behaviors and then it will deactivate. So, oops, I changed Lauren, the like one. One, one thing just for the group here, I mean, the grit, we showed you collaborative following, right? That would be, you know, a tool for boom towing um, on this grid tool uh, really we think is a good tool for, for skimming operations um, once a skimmer would be outfitted, um, which we've done some work in evaluating. There's some things to solve on doing remotely or operated skimming with use, you know, debris and stuff getting in and making sure your, your skimmer's set right. Um, but from the fundamentals of boat operation, I mean, it's pretty cool stuff to be able to you know, start to investigate re removing personnel from the environment. Um, and uh, you know, this is a tool for doing that. Yeah, I think so. So I don't know if I should be looking. I don't at know how much more time we questions. have, but um, you have a few more minutes. And I apologize okay. for we started about ten minutes early, so that's the silver right. lining. It's all right. Um, we, I have one more slide to show you guys uh, following Lauren's demo. So Lauren, go ahead and wrap up with whatever you'd like to to uh, close with uh, in the next couple of minutes. Yeah, so um, we have just a question in the um, Q&A section that I just wanted to address. So uh, can you set a maximum or do you or do not exceed speed for the daughter vessel, for example, when towing boom to avoid high throttle position? So yes, you can cap the speed of the autonomous vessel. Um, mm -hmm 
based off of um, based off of the the vessel itself. So it, you can also do like max rudder angles, um, like the rate of turn, things like that. That's all part of the tuning process. So that's um, definitely doable. So I kind of sped through um, the the dynamic edits because I was trying to disable that. Um, the depth behavior, but you can see on the right hand side, we have abort, which is going to abort the mission. We have pause, so I can hit pause right here. Um, the mode up in the top right corner is going to change to pause. You can see the vessel stopped and Bill can actually take control. He can take manual control and drive around. The only thing he would have to do in order for me to take back control is to put the engines back in neutral um, and then it will resume and get back on track. So um, that's, that's pretty useful, I would say, for for um, if you had something really small, maybe that you didn't detect, so if you saw like a lobster buoy, which is huge in Boston, um, you could you could stop and manually avoid that. Um, and then we also have the edit button that pops up even when you are engaged in a mission. So you can change the default um, turn and leg speed. You can turn on auto repeat on the fly. You can turn on and off any of these behaviors, which is what I did for the depth avoidance. So we could go a little bit faster and then you can enable collision avoidance on the fly as well. Um, once you click through all those menus, if you don't change anything, you can actually add, oops, sorry, you can add waypoints to the mission. So you see at the bottom right, the total mission time and the time to next waypoint is 17 seconds. When I hit okay, it's gonna update that and it's going to add those two new waypoints to the mission. So Phil, um, I'll hand it back over to you unless uh, I'm missing something. I think, yeah, thank you, Lauren. And, um, you know, for everyone seeing all this, um, especially as like Lauren goes through all the menus and the options of like how we can set things. I mean, what you're seeing is, uh, you know, a few years of work of, of uh, our testing team, Lauren's team. Um, we've got about 4,000 hours on this product and um, it doesn't stop. So we're out there every day, uh, rain, shine or snow and um, hard at work building this product and making it better. But that said, uh, I would like to share um, my screen for Lauren when you get a sec. Um, if you could stop sharing and I'll share mine real quick for one last slide. There you go. Oops. Yeah, that said, um, you know, we we have our product out in the field um, already. And so, you know, all this work that we're describing to you and, and the stable product that we've built is out on the water. Uh, someone asked some questions in the chat about, um, you, you know, where the IMO and the U.S. Coast Guard stand and all that. And and um, a lot of that stuff's in development. We're, we're, we are one of the, the, the companies working on our own to to seek classification um, approval, both from the vessel perspective and the product uh, type approval perspective. So we're working on those categories. Um, and we are working with, we are actually working with the US Coast Guard R&D Center, which I believe there's some folks on this call. Um, and so uh, we're working with uh, some folks there. Um, we, we've been doing a bit of work with ABS and some of those classification sites. So that's it, there is a lot of work there. Um, all these projects that you see all over the world, they're, they're just some of them. Um, we, we, we've been doing a lot of stuff, stuff in the survey market um, to serve the wind farm uh, community and just mapping in general, all the pressure to map uh, more of our world's uh, beautiful oceans. Um, and we do a little bit of work with the, the, the Department of Defense uh, in the U.S. as well. So um, that's, you know, hopefully you get a good view of, of our company. I think you know, what we'd like to you know, take away from this is just look autonomy is real uh and and this is capability that um can enable work boats to do more with less effort and um if we can we can we can help uh spill response applications um we'd be happy to do that we're happy to talk with you about um the successes the challenges and and um you know please visit us online and send us an inquiry uh if you'd like to learn more Okay. Really, thank um, you for the opportunity. Yeah, thank you, Phil and Lauren. And uh, we do have some questions, uh, but I have one of my own before we get into those. Um, 
you know, okay, you've got this vessel out there and there is no human on board, right? Uh, it's pilotless on board and it's being controlled remotely. Now in the, uh, in the drone world, uh, there's something we call a flyaway where the, uh, the pilot in command loses connection well, with the drone and it just takes off. Um, what are your provisions for that happening to you, to one of your vessels? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll start and then Lauren can, um, can follow on here, but there's, there's a couple provisions. One of them Lauren was starting to describe was uh, like a perimeter line around the mission. So it's, uh, she refers to it, we, we refer to it as a boundary box. And if the vessel were to leave that boundary box or boundary polygon, uh, the engines just automatically go to neutral. Um, now that, that can be the case where you have communications or you don't have communications. And um, as soon as the vessel crosses that boundary box, it'll stop. Uh, in the event of just pure comms loss, right? Like let's say it's loss of bandwidth or let's say it's, it's uh, uh, intolerable latency. We also have the ability to do two things. Some of our customers say, no, I want you to keep the boat to keep going. And so um, that's obviously more on the military side of stuff, but um, we do have the ability to, to set that according to what the customer wants. Um, so in the, in, the, you know, in the commercial world, largely, that's a very, um, we, we set it to be sensitive. Um, and so we, we have the ability to adjust. But Lauren, uh, please feel free to add on to, to my response. Yeah, I think you answered it really well. Um, so we do have those fail stops where if the vessel and um, exited that that safe area that we've selected, um, the mission's going to abort. The, the leash timeout is the other thing that Phil was talking about with the connection. Um, and obviously, we have the abort button on the vessel now. We're working on something that we call the M stop, which is for Michael, our CEO, because um, he wants something that's independent of the system, maybe over satellite, something that um, if we did have no response from something, if something crashed, maybe we'd have like an emergency stop button that we could we could shut the system down. Um, and that's, that's something that we're working on. But yeah, right now it would be, um, you could, even if you didn't have a bad connection, but something was going wrong with the system, if you unplug it, if you disconnect the VPN, it's going to do the same thing as what Phil was, was talking about. Okay. Well, thank you for that. Um, we do have uh, a few questions coming up and we have several minutes to answer them. So Jenna, um, could you go over the, the questions that you've received? Yeah, we have one from Bill Adams. Could the operation of the skimmer be tied to the boat operation, such as stopping while oil was transferred to a bladder? Phil, you're, uh, mu you're muted. Yeah, yeah. Um, we, we, we could. Um, typically, though, you know, when it comes to, um, if, you were, if you were in an unmanned circumstance, it, we don't do a lot of close-in maneuvers. So the technology is not to the point where you can do like, like leave the dock, right? And then, and then go out to your, 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 in your harbor. Um, it's really a, a outside the sea buoy uh, capable. So in terms of like coming alongside another vessel uh, un, in an unmanned context, um, that's probably not gonna happen in autonomy mode the way Lauren planned it out. But what you could do is you get the vessel to a certain point in autonomy mode, and then you just switch over to that remote helm unit that I was describing in the beginning of the presentation. And so that you would use as your manual point of control to come alongside the, uh, the, 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 uh, the storage vessel and, and offload um, the skimmer uh, contaminants. Okay, very good. Jenna, I see another one there. Uh, yeah, there was um, a comment uh, from Christy McKinney that there was a, a Bessie project um, 1037 that completed a number of years ago um, on autonomous uh, skimming vessels that conducted some work on looking at skimming patterns and that it may be useful to review for the grid pattern work. Um, we have another question. Um, 
that is, um, are there license and area restrictions like there are for UAV usage, like um, near airports for UAVs? Is there something similar? Yeah, um, so the way we would answer that one is, is, I mean, in terms of using the system, the way we're using it, where there's a person on the boat as like a safety driver, um, there's really no restrictions for that. Um, we, our customers are um, trained, you know, they get a training, there's instructions on how to use it and when to use it and where to use it. Um, if you were operating in an unmanned context, um, you are uh, liable to the, all of the Coast Guard rules, which do require all the things, right? Having a watch to being able to respond to all the coal reg stuff. And so um, the way our projects that are uh, deployed, uh, both in manned and unmanned context uh, in the commercial world, they each get vetted by the local Coast Guard districts. Um, and then that goes up to like the MSC in Washington and then uh, so we've got a couple projects that are operating on that context, and it's really the districts that determine the use um, according to the specific, you know, case by case use. Great. I think we have um, one time for one more question, um, and that's: uh, Are there any? Uh, if people are want to learn more, are there any additional trainings or webinars, demos? Um, for like vessels of opportunity, anything in the future where people can um, learn more? Yeah, um, you know, outside of spill response, we're doing a demonstration. Um, I honestly, I don't have control of my schedule, uh, but uh, if you look on our LinkedIn page, uh, there's a, a big event that we're, we're hosting a webinar um, on the use of this technology in the survey world. I think it might be tomorrow, I'm sorry. Thursday, um, so it's the 25th. Thank you, Lauren. You, I figured you would know. Um, yeah, that 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 would be a good one. Um, or please feel free to reach reach out to us directly. We'd be happy to um, host a private demonstration for those that are interested. Um, you know, Lauren and her team are out there, like I said, every day, and you know, we'd be pleased to um, answer questions. Excellent. Could you also post that link um, to to those trainings into the chat for folks? Yeah, let me do that. Thanks. You got it. And I think for time, that's about it. Great. Hey, well, thank you, Phil and, uh, and Lauren. That was uh, most excellent and uh, obviously captured a lot of people's attention. So um, good well, thank job. You. And, thank um, you for, for having us. Oh, yes, of course.